Consider supporting Arkea Soup on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Link available in the video description. Good morning, Chris Capel. <laughs> Good morning, Mark. Good How morning. can I help? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Now, for the for folks at home, I should explain. Uh, Chris and I have a, a a small, modest history together, so there might be some um, some winks and nudges here and there uh, along the way. But um, I've actually invited Chris to uh, talk today about the Yarm helmet, and uh, as we were just talking about before we started recording, the Yarm helmet both is well known amongst archaeologists in particular but also is not as well known as perhaps it might be in so much as it is well what is it chris what is it it's uh, I, first of all i suppose it's a museum object and that's that's where we first met it was was um uh myself and jennifer jones just being invited to uh uh Preston Hall Museum, as it was there in Preston Park Museum now, mm. um, just to look at this thing that they'd had for several years. Um, it, it was an iron helmet, uh, quite clearly, but they were uncertain about the date. Um, and because it was found in uh, circumstances where there was no archaeology, it was, it was dug up by men laying sewers uh, in Yarm in the late 50s, early 60s. Mm -hmm. um, we there was there was some some uncertainty about its dating um and uh, we were being asked to have a look and advise about its care and uh, whether we could suggest um in this day and age um whether there was a way of recovering more information about it hmm. and so we had a look took some photographs wrote a report um and they um were able to to react to that they were able to create uh, new conditions for its care um, and um, it went on uh, display which it hadn't done for been on display for many years but we went it went on display in their their brand new uh, reconditioned museum mm -hmm. and um, eventually uh, many years later we got back in touch and uh, we were then able to uh, get the helmet uh, up to Durham. We had to ensure that we could make sure that we, we kept the um, low RH conditions, kept it dry so that it, it didn't corrode any further mm -hmm. and then start our research on it. And that research was eventually published in Medieval Archaeology about a year ago. And um, you know, we've now shown, I hope, um, that it is uh, indeed a uh, helmet of the uh, probably the 10th century, certainly the 9th to 11th century, um, mm -hmm. making it, uh, as we were talking about earlier, the, the second Viking helmet ever discovered and the first in the UK. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the previous one, which I believe is the Yerman Boo, or it might be Yerman Boo um, helmet from Norway, uh, is quite well known for, for it being a relatively especially compared to the arm helmet relatively ornate helmet it's a, it's another spangle helmet it's got the sort of the, the glasses on the front um ornate is probably the wrong word it's got a refined compound curvature going on this kind of thing um but but the arm helmet i've seen a few people including some well-known uh early medieval specialists perhaps even a professor or two saying um that, that they're still on the fence about this helmet in terms of what what it what it means now I would invite you at this point to speculate um, on why do you think that there is some resistance to this being a Viking helmet? In so much as I, I, I'll give you, I'll give you my pet theory initially, uh, and then we'll I, we'll come on to the, the technical stuff in a moment. But my pet theory initially is that um, uh, it's probably not pretty enough. In so much as it look, it looks kind of like a, it's, you know, it's it, uh, it's not the sort of thing that you're going to see reenactors wearing in their droves. Although, actually, I did notice this morning that there's actually an Etsy store now selling replicas of this helmet online. Yes. So yes. hopefully we will see reenactors wearing it in their droves. We will. But, but do, do, do you think that, that, that there's a certain image of of the Vikings, especially sort of, the, I guess, the later Viking um, period in this in this country in particular, that means that, that, that for many years this was seen as potentially 
uh, a hodgepodge of something else or something that was a bit unknown. I think one person even described it as potentially being, this was online last year, as potentially being almost uh, like a, a bit of like a stage prop, this kind of thing. So what, 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 how do you think it fits into that sort of typology and, and why do you think there's been some resistance? Okay, for, the interesting thing is that your experience is slightly different to mine. Okay. Um, when we uh, first looked at it, I was very conscious that um, it had first uh, photographs of the, the helmet had first been circulated to the community back in about 1974. Mm. Uh, Marilyn Brown, the uh, assistant curator uh, at the Dorman Museum, which held the, the helmet for a while, um, circulated um, those photographs to the Royal Armouries and the British Museum. And they, they both did that kind of, ooh, ooh, I don't know about that. As you say, it looked very different to the, um, the Sutton New Helmet or the, the Bentic Range Helmet, the things that they they'd had, knew and loved. Mm. So um, there was a kind of a, a, a caution, but you could see that they neither wished to say yes or no. Um, and uh, that kind of sitting on the fence has been, there, shall we say, the, the default position since 1974. Now, when I, uh, when we we got it up to Durham and were able to to look at it properly for and in detail for the first time, that was really the the issue that we faced. And so, when you look at the the article I wrote in Medieval Archaeology, I literally went through every bit of that process to try and explain um, why it's made the right way, um, you know, why the materials of which it's made are correct, why there is absolutely no later feature. We explored the idea that it was in fact a stage prop from the 19th century and showed that that really wasn't likely to be the case. It contained features that they would not have known about. Um, and we tried to really slay each one of those beasts and dragons and say look there's evidence for this evidence now the 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 paper itself was um, fully refereed um including by um, all sorts of people <laughs> including people who have been the head of the british museum so a lot of people got to see it and comment on it in various ways and everyone sort of well it's okay yeah i think it's, it's fairly convincing um and um the impression I was given by the contacts that I've had is that I think you probably changed our minds, but I think the word probably is the, the important one there. Um, it is difficult because it is cruder than mm -hmm. uh, the other examples. Um, I've tried to show in the paper that that's probably because it's a little bit later. And one of the things that the ideas that people have in their head are, as you were saying, these are pretty decorated helmets. They've got largely those from the sixth to eighth century in their heads, the copper gates and the, the sudden who's and all the rest of it, which are well made for kind of princely lordly figures. Uh, and the decoration is a key part of that. And they are, you know, but they're often di directly connected to particular individuals, aren't they? So often the the, the the decoration will reflect the person who's paid for it, or maybe the family who who owns that's it, right. this kind of thing. That's right. Um, whereas, do you think the the arm helmet isn't necessarily of that kind of? <laughs> well, it, exactly. We're we're getting a little more working class here now. Yeah. We're we're we're, <laughs> we're really getting to something which is um, uh, not so refined. And mm. what we're looking at is is um, the kind of the working warrior of the. 9th, 10th, 11th, probably 10th centuries, most of them, most likely. And you're right, they become anonymous. With, there's not so much art history connected with it. Mm. Uh, it doesn't look as neat. It's more a mass-produced artefact. And fundamentally, the, the archaeologists are less comfortable with that type of object. Um, now, I suspect that... Um, We've produced all the evidence and you know, people are there to, to read it. And of course, they can make up their own minds. But we have tried to show that um, really that that old idea is no longer tenable. And especially the metallographic evidence is pretty convincing. 
there's no way that that metal that it's made of is something that's come from the post-medieval world. It is a, uh, you know, it is, it is, has to be, you know, pre-1600, something like that. So, so really, what, 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 the what? problem is then okay. that the archaeologists are uncomfortable with scientific evidence. Um, they don't really want to draw that in. They're much happier with beasts who are biting their own tails than they are with talking about the size of ferrite grains. And you know, that's that, that has always been an issue for the subject and it will change as time goes on and, and people read about it. So I feel that we've we've kind of made the argument and if people aren't comfortable with it, I I I would be interested to see them um kind of come and actually then articulate that because one of the very interesting things is that I haven't had any responses from colleagues saying, I think you're wrong. No. No one has actually emailed me or written or spoke to me face to face and said, I don't think you're right. No. They accept that the evidence is there. They're just not very comfortable with it yet. But that is true for uh, many uh, aspects of, 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 of archaeological uh, thinking or uh, which, which are you know, not, not so widely known. Uh, but I... Yeah. Yeah, you know, that, that that's that's perfectly reasonable. There, there, you know, if you if you look at human psychology, once you've made your mind up about something, that the idea of changing it is much more difficult for a human brain to do. That if there is something new that we haven't thought about before, then great, we can entertain ideas about it. But once we've decided, oh, we're not, mm. you know, we think it's such and such, to actually have to change your mind, mm. very very difficult. And so um, that's yeah, you know, I understand their 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 caution. Um, but I think you know we we have the the balance of evidence now has, has clearly been done, and I don't actually think there's any more evidence you could find one way or the other, and so you have to say where's the balance of evidence now. So I suppose a couple of things come to mind. Um, first of all, I guess uh, I'm just curious about this idea, this idea of pre 16th century metal. Can we just sort of explore that briefly? You mentioned ferrite grain is it, is it just to do with the refinement of, of the material itself okay there, there are several aspects to this um the um when we get to making iron um and we are starting to use blast furnaces 16th century we we, we move to uh, to making particularly steel uh, and iron by what's called the indirect process we will we literally uh, smelt the iron or make it uh, a liquid metal and then basically we will take impurities out of it um, now that process tends to leave uh, trace elements like uh, manganese in the metal mm. if you go to the medieval period um, you're using low temperatures. You're not actually melting the metal. Um, you're largely doing this in a kind of solid state way. And so what you get is is a kind of a mixture of, of small bits of metal and slag that you have to hammer and hammer and hammer and hammer to, to drive all the slag out. And, and this is this bloomery process actually then creates your, your metal lumps. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, you find that the mang things like manganese are in the slag particles, but not in the metal. Mm -hmm. And where do we find our manganese? In the slag particles. And then the, all the other things that go along with that, that bloomery process, um, higher rates of phosphorus um, and differential size of ferrite grains, because you're just having to fold the metal one on top of another. Um, some bits are well hammered, some bits are not. So you get these, 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 these changes in ferrite grain shape, uh, some small, some large. Typical of, of this kind of hammered uh, uh, bloomery iron. And that is what the helmet is made of, as are as is the copper gate helmet, as is the all the um, iron objects from, from copper gate and, and that those kind of uh, early medieval, in, indeed into high medieval uh, period. Mm. So it, the metal absolutely fits with that. It does not fit with anything that was made from the later period. Right. That alone is very clear evidence, I think. Mm. And so, so, so um, if I've understood correctly, if you achieve those higher temperatures, those other particles are more likely to become more evenly part part of the actual constitution of the metal itself, as opposed. Yeah, to it being... will be homogeneous. It yes, will homogeneous. all the grain size will be the same shape. Um, as I say, uh, the trace elements will all be in the metal, yeah. not in the slag. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
my second thought then, based on what you were saying previously, is is uh, an awful lot of received wisdom um, goes around about uh, things like, especially again because Vikings are are so sort of people go oh Viking you know, it's one of the focuses isn't it of of especially popular popular notions of history uh, you know Romans Vikings you know, it's just it's just a thing, but people talk about how um, often people from a, an academic background but also moving in through into for example the reenactor kind of world uh, that, that I was definitely exposed to a lot when I was working at um, at Yorvik and the York Archaeological Trust was that there's this notion that helmets and this sort of material didn't survive in great quantities because it was relatively utilitarian and it could be reused mm -hmm. for other purposes and is that more or less what what we're seeing potentially confirmed in something like the arm helmet whereby actually it's not the best quality thing in the world and if you need a uh, some horseshoes you can take it apart and, and make it into horseshoes and and therefore perhaps the number of helmets is not so much to do with a lack of uh preservation in the ground but potentially just the fact that this is this is a useful substance that can be repurposed is do you think that's what's going on well that's certainly one of the the, the things that's going on definitely um the uh, I mean, in those early graves, we have inhumation graves, and therefore we have the helmets surviving there, whether it be Bentley Grange or Sutton Hoo or wherever, there's a, a survival mechanism. Mm. So although there are very few helmets, there's a, there's a way by which they survive, or a number of them survive. Mm. When you get to the, um, when we're in the 10th, 11th century, we're into uh, an era where we, we don't have uh, grave goods, we, we, we become Christian. And as you say, so we, we, the, that survival mechanism doesn't exist anymore. The um, objects themselves um, are thin iron metal. Mm. So if you just simply put it in the ground and let it corrode, it will go. Mm. Um, so you know, they're not gonna survive you know, if you, you know, the, the, um, even if you're at the Battle of Hastings or whatever, you've got a lot of these things in the ground, they're sheet metal, they will corrode away in the time scales that we're talking about. Mm. Um, and as you crucially say, we know that stuff is gathered up from, uh, we can see it being gathered at the Bay of Tapestry, uh, and it's recycled, reused, uh, it may be reused in its present form, it can always be melted down and, and recycled again. And that uh, we know that the material has considerable value, it can be reworked and reworked. And so the fact that anything survives is, is, is remarkable. Interestingly, when we get to the point of um, armories and castles, there's a tradition that e even where you're keeping these things as a, as a supply of arms and armor, what you do is you take the oldest one and when you need to repair something, you beat that flat and use that for the repair. So it's always the oldest thing that is being lost, the thing that we're interested in. And what you have are an awful lot of 17th, 18th, 19th century bits of, uh, of parade armor made of, of some earlier metal. But um, crucially, in our case, we, we, we looked at um, part of that element and you know, why did it actually survive the ground? It's this thin sheet metal. That's, the, you know, that's very odd. Um, interestingly, um, well, we, we first of all were able to look at the minerals that were present on the helmet and show that it had been in waterlogged environment. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason it survived. Just like the Coppergate helmet, it survived because the conditions were waterlogged. They changed later on in its history, and that's why it started to corrode. And that's why it wasn't so obvious to people when it was first unearthed. But we were able, through X-ray diffraction, uh, Fourier transform infrared absorption spectroscopy and other techniques, to show that those minerals were actually um, present. And therefore, um, you know, it had this long period of being in waterlogged environment. So um, waterlogged, i.e. anoxic, so no anoxic, oxygen. Anoxic, no, no oxygen, yeah. so it's going to survive just like the Coppergate helmet, exactly the same as the Coppergate helmet, mm -hmm. and probably was deposited in a pit in a fairly similar way, uh, probably to protect it from um, marauders or, you know, someone didn't wish to acknowledge that they had that in their past. Um, that it had been hidden probably for some reason and put into a, a pit, probably with the aim of retrieval, because as we were saying earlier, you can recycle this 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 metal and it can you can always get something from it. So um, if you're hiding it, it, it's usually for a reason. And then, you know, you don't make it, you forget where you put it, whatever. It survives and we find it. Um, so I think though those kind of mechanisms 
have led to uh, these, these very few survivals, and that's why we've got very few uh, objects of, of this date. When we go to the historic texts and, you know, well, just look at the Bayer Tapestry, they are all wearing helmets, almost mm. all. Um, all the Normans, even their archers, are wearing helmets. Uh, the house carls, uh, the Saxons are. Only the members of the feared, uh, the, the kind of militia, Saxon militia, they're not. And according to statute, they should have been. Um, we also get wills and various other things showing that there are an awful lot of helmets, hauberks, and, and that type of mm. material actually um, being uh, left to people. So it, it is around, but it's been recycled and reused. Uh, and that's why it doesn't survive. I, I, I'm going to um, uh, move slightly away from the... Um... I suppose the the, the the analysis of of the material itself for a moment, if if we may, uh, and don't, go, don't, don't, don't worry, we're not we're not going to go on for hours here. But I'm, I'm just curious about about another aspect here that, that sort of comes to mind. So, for example, when you um when you consider, for example, Beowulf, there, there's a point in that story where um our hero is is you know traipsing through a place where there's lots of treasure that's been amassed by you know, by monsters and evil things, and he observes that uh, there's a helmet that, um, and the, the text makes a point of saying that the helmet is uh, not shiny as it should be. Essentially, it's not been polished, it's not been cared for, yep. and therefore it's dull and um, and uh, and it has been neglected. Uh, I can't help but wonder, in the context of something like the arm helmet, and this idea of... Um, of perhaps having to bury it in order to maybe obscure an element of your past or some form of allegiance that you may have had, if that is if that's a, a hypothetical possibility, uh, the shape and the form of this otherwise useful material seem seemingly is potent. But but do you think therefore that there's actually a, there's a there's a sort of a spectrum between highly polished and um, and uh, functional that nonetheless has that has this sort of identifiable lineage connecting them in so much as in so much as if this is a, a you know a working class equivalent of a flat cap type thing um <laughs> uh, the flat cap is nonetheless identifiable isn't it it tends to be for example a northern mode of dress this kind you know this sort of thing and it says something about who you are and potentially where you've come from of course some people wear it ironically now we shouldn't go too far down that analogy but but my point nonetheless stands i think in so much as well, how do you think we should think about these helmets as existing there therefore obviously we've, we haven't got very many to go on but we do have things like beowulf talking about them in other texts as well so so how should people imagine helmets at this time uh, and should they be seen as special or or, or, or otherwise some, some how powerful in that sense Yes, I think that's that's quite a tricky question in some senses to answer. The fact that we can look at uh, things like the Coppergate helmet, where we have, um, because of the the waterlogged conditions, uh, survived all the way through, it meant that when we looked at the surface of that, we were able to see that it had been extensively polished. And some of the brass decoration had almost been polished flat. Mm. So we know that that had been... Um, cleaned up on many, many occasions uh, in order that that, that wear could happen. And so would that, would the that idea be, of... So would that be potentially using an abrasive material then to achieve that? Sort of presumably, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, they, uh, they would have had... It, it could be either... It's most probably abrasive. There may be some chemical element to it through the juice of uh, fruits or whatever, but in, in most cases, yes, it's likely to be abrasive. Okay. So, um, and we also know that there's something of a date difference between the the um, production of the Coppergate helmet and its burial from the, the difference between the uh, typological dating and the dendrochronology for the um, wood of the um, lining of the pit in which it was found. So, um, Undoubtedly, it, it's in service for maybe 100 years. It's, it's quite a long time, but we, it's clearly being polished up. So the notion of the helmet being uh, shiny and in good condition is clearly important there. When we come to the uh, the arm helmet, it, it's less clear because it, it isn't around for so long. 
Um, there is some evidence of wear. If we look at the holes uh, on the, um, the base of the, the helmet, which would have held the male curtain, we can see that the, the holes are not circular, but they have been smoothed a little bit. Now, they're not in a tear shape, so it's not been worn for decades and decades, mm. but it has been smoothed. So it, there has been a, a certain amount of wear on it. Mm. Um, clearly, the, the junctions of the plates are, are smooth. Um, so there has been some polishing of that, uh, again, presumably with abrasive. Now, how far we go down that line, you know, what it had to look like when we went to war um, and um, what it was looked like when it was sitting at home is, is far from clear. We don't know. Um, well, I mean, again, it, people it, do talk about bright helmets sometimes in, yeah, in talking yeah. about armories. So we imagine that, you know, as as now, if you're you're out with mates or whatever you know you're, you're dressing up a little bit um so i imagine it, it, it was supposed to look a bit shinier but um I, as you say there was a point when certain things would have come in and out of fashion um, mm. far more slowly i imagine than today but um and it, it, it's that functionality that um if you've got to stand there behind a shield wall with people raining spears and arrows and other things down you by damn, you need a helmet. Uh, otherwise, you ain't going to survive it. So that functionality keeps going in the same way as you may have some of your father's tools or your grandfather's tools. And you talk, it still works. So why would I need to change it? So that functionality will continue. And especially if you can you know, keep the metal from from rusting, um, then all, all, all the better. But eventually, presumably, um, you know, it, 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 you know, it may become an heirloom. Mm. Uh, it may, may become too powerful to you know, simply dismantle and, and, and recycle. Maybe it has to be um, treated a slightly different way mm. um, in the same way as we have um, uh, pilgrim tokens and badges that you know, dis uh, discarded into rivers. They can't just be thrown out in any other way. So we have evidence of, of, of things which are a bit too powerful. Um, and it's possible that that may happen to the helmet, but we'd need far more evidence than than, than we've got at the moment to, to really make a case for that. So therefore, uh, you talk about function, it is therefore potentially a one element of polishing actually functional in so much as it is the opposite of allowing corrosion to form. It's not necessarily for an aesthetic, perhaps. Um, but then, I suppose, conversely, and this is where we come to your your particular, we come back to you as, as a conservator, this notion, this notion of um, of authenticity through things like patina, and and also the ongoing question of, of to what extent is too much in terms of restoration or conservation. The sort of balance that that that, that um, actually we've talked about, folks, in an, another video, which I'll link at the end of this of this video. Um, uh, do, do you th do you feel as though that the there might have been a, a tension between those things, and so much as or, or, or or do you think this this notion of actually of presuming that the aesthetic is what matters because because for, for example i've heard it said that if you had a shiny helmet you're also saying here's my head my head's here <laughs> you know you can't you can't sneak through a forest for example with a really shiny helmet i mean we, we hear this every now and then anecdotally with police helmets don't we and the idea that the victorian badges had to be you know darkened and so the moon wouldn't glint off them this kind of thing um it, it, do you think Perhaps actually what I'm describing here is the fact that there were probably many different answers from many different times, depending on the, the specific moment and the function that, that, that people desire from these items. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the problems we have is that whenever we're thinking about an aesthetic, there's the risk that we impose our own aesthetic ideas on um, uh, what was going on in the past. I mean, uh, but we can also see that certain things function or don't function well. So if you, for instance, have incised designs on gold work, if the gold is quite shiny, then you can see these incised lines quite well. Mm. If the gold is dull, you don't see them so well. If you bother to put a decoration on, surely that was meant, meant to be seen in the same uh way you could argue that if you have a, a helmet like the coppergate helmet if that is actually bright shiny iron and looks silvery then the brass um edging strips and and decoration 
doesn't show very well if mm. it's patinated if it is is a the, the iron itself is actually a black color mm. as you might have by by allowing a natural patination or by deliberately patinating it um then the brass fittings look really impressive mm. there and that's the condition it's now displayed in mm. and it they look kind of gold so you can see that they it has more impact one way than another now does well, that mean that that was how it was done in the past mm. don't know sure sort of answer difficult for us to tell that um where we get very well preserved surfaces we can look and see but it's it's really subtle really difficult and very many of the natural patinated finishes of course correspond with natural corrosion processes mm. and so it's very difficult for us to discern one over another mm. and, and, and yet and times yet, and yet we do live in a world where things like bluing solution is part of of absolutely. metallurgy so, so we, we we desire um controlled corrosion for aesthetic that's effect. right and and the ancient chinese used to to deliberately corrode some of their their bronze artifacts for even when they were then taken up and, and displayed and used because uh the idea of antiquity is often uh highly prized in in quite a number of societies so um clearly there there are there are possibilities and the deliberate patination as we have with many of our statues and, and, and as you say, many, many functional devices is very helpful because it, it prevents and retards corrosion. Um, you know, you, you might deliberately just wipe it with oil. You might allow a pattern to form and, and, and cover with other protective coating as well. So there are a range of possibilities. And the short answer is um, with a, a sheet iron of um, lower value, from uh 900 years ago is 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 really difficult to tell um the fact that we actually were e even able to uh identify its kind of object biography its history was was probably about as as far as we could go as they did at the Coppergate helmet um we are um technology probably isn't quite good enough yet to really get to the point of of of, of seeing if it can ever be preserved, um, what the surface finishes were like in antiquity. But, you know, watch this space. One day someone will come up and it, it's most likely to be from um, things like a waterlogged context again, where there has been no corrosion. Mm. As soon as we get it up, we, we will be able to try and have a look. And especially if we get two or three of them fairly similar, then we may get some idea. One of the things that always um, uh, surprises me is... Uh, it's always um, things like painted pottery. Mm -hmm. You look at the anthropological record, we've got a lot of painted pottery. What about prehistory? We would expect far more painted pottery than we, we got virtually nothing of that. So, um, yeah, you would expect that to have originally been painted. And for it's for up to us now to try and find those those traces in, in when we get well-produced pots. Um, so any archaeologist out there listening, yeah. Think about this. Uh, and again, what, what will it be? Will it be simple pigments, iron oxides, uh, lime um, and, uh, or chalk, um, white? Well, possibly. So it will be very difficult to tell from the soil that surrounds it. Mm. But I would certainly expect us to be getting things like painted pottery in prehistory. And we, we have very little evidence. We have some, but very little evidence for that gem. So uh, as ever, one of the problems seems to be resolution in these sorts of scenarios doesn't it um and and as you say i guess preservation comes into that and then the distance between recovery and 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 analysis um and the distance between the archaeologist and the conservator you know yeah. if we're busy doing that you know commercial thing of we dig it up and then we have to assess it before it goes to a conservator um you know a lot of traces will be lost and if we make doing everything for a price well you know is that going to be something that uh, gets lost in that so i i don't know i i find I have concerns about some of that evidence being lost as a result of commercial archaeological pressures. Not that anyone's not doing their job right, but as soon as you put that kind of management system into place, um, you know, you really do rely on someone to go, hang on, this object really is special. We need to take it outside our normal system and do something different with it. That does happen, but mm. does it happen enough and often enough? Yeah, it requires awareness. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I suppose the final question for you uh, on the on the, on this matter um, would be: what, what do you what if you could 
and and I often think, I often include this in sort of in um, more general sort of meet the archaeologist interviews. But I think this 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 one bears out in this instance. If you could um, sort of impart some sort of knowledge into into more people's brains, if you could just sort of just insert it in there somehow, what what would you want more people to know about these sorts of issues? So whether it's specifically Viking helmets or or metal or our relationship to the to 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 even corrosion. Uh, what uh, you know, uh, carte blanche. What would you What would you like more people to know about? Cause, and and just just while you're thinking about that, I, I suppose what I would say is one of the things I remember, uh, and that I still carry with me very fondly today from 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 time learning from you, um, at Durham was the, the this notion that actually, precisely the, 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 there's this question of of how far is too far and and the fact that actually objects have a legitimate life beyond their their newness through what we might term to be erosion and corrosion and and a form of decay into what they are now and actually they sort of continue to they are they they're not just so like a roman sword isn't just roman it is also actually existing in the 21st century and yeah. the idea of, of return returning it back to being a roman sword is in some ways deeply artificial um, because you can't you, it's not like you can you can you can re-add the material that, that's, that's been altered or changed over time so this sort of weird negotiation that you have with artifacts is something that I've always uh, I've always valued and I've always carried that you know whenever I've been thinking about this sort of stuff so that sort of thing what 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 do you want more people to, to know to think about Mm. I think I think that's a, that's a difficult one. It's like having to choose kind of a, 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 just a couple of records on your your desert island or whatever. Um, I suppose um, there are there are there are two things that that that, that um, I I would particularly mention. One is that um, I, I just would like more people to know uh, or be more familiar with the way in which materials decay. So that when they see them in the ground, they are just more alerted to that's unusual, that's different, that doesn't look right, um, and there's no excuse, there's no other way of doing it other than by excavating and working with real objects. And one of the concerns I have um, with um, university courses and all the rest is the way that people want to put things online, uh, that they, the students don't actually work with real life on objects. They don't handle them, they're not familiar with them, uh, and they don't, don't uh, and then they get interested in, oh, I'm interested in the ancient Egyptians. And then they don't know anything about prehistoric pottery or post-medieval pottery or any of it. Um, they, they, they just try and focus too quickly on the thing they want to know. So I, what I would like is that range of experience of real live honest to god objects that that you know uh you all archaeologists finding in that sense you may not know but you may not finding. but yeah. it's just you know you walk into any museum store you go to any dig any archaeological thing you do not know what you're going to come across and you just need that awareness of things and and um, particularly the condition of things and what they should look like and you know something should just start alarm bells ringing and the best archaeologist i ever met just had almost like an intuitive sixth sense about mm, well, that's that's not right that's that's unusual and the conservators as well the best ones just no, almost without thinking about it, where something's not right and something suddenly turns out to be interesting. And the other thing that I would, um, I suppose, draw, want to draw people's attention to, make them aware of, is the way in which um, mass-produced objects are interesting. Mm. that we focus so much on the bespoke objects that are made, the highly decorated. Um, I, I did my PhD on medieval pins, which are perhaps <laughs> the most small, ubiquitous things you can ever imagine, but they contain within them um, a history of changing manufacture. They um, show um, you know, a myriad of trades must have existed for this small little pin to come into existence. Mm. And all you need to know is that kind of that technology of manufacturing all these things, whether it be a flint flake or a pin or a screw. Um, and there are that, that the way in which archaeologists focus on the special, the ritual, the, uh, the, the extraordinary. Oldest. The oldest, mm. oh, God heavens. Um, 
those things really kind of definitely are, are a bit frustrating. There won't be any older, <laughs> so they're gone. <laughs> and so we stop looking at the others, and that's the problem. And and in particular, mass uh, manufacture tells us about the way in which economics change, about mm, technology changing over periods of time. And so they're quite a good barometer of stuff like that. Much more so you, with an individual object, you get a craftsman working, you get a uh, something for one of people. So it, it's often not um, typical of what people used or did. Uh, and might be influenced by by you know one particular customer, one particular uh, uh, craftsman. Mm. But those those little pins, <laughs> they, they they change very little over time. But that's that's what people were using. That's what people were doing with them. And so they are a kind of a, a real barometer of people's lives. In a, in a, in a uh, you know. and that's the, the thing which I quite like about the arm helmet is that it's not quite the helmet of every man, but but pretty clear every warrior certainly mm. and so this is a glimpse into what it was like and we focus on the man on the horse not the poor schmuck in the shield wall fighting for his life yeah. um and that's actually who our ancestors are they're the, the people third rank back in the shield wall <laughs> who are just pushing for <laughs> all they were worth. yeah exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh um it's interesting just to slightly um slightly grow, grow that thought a little bit there's this there's this idea that um, in some ways i suppose mass produced objects also they reflect a form of consensus don't they so the idea of, of as you say with with pins um and different different uses of pins and different people requiring this this particular technology it, it it's because on mass people have decided this is how we're going to use this object and the, and, and the same goes for I think the installation of seat belts in cars, for example, you know, there's a point yeah. at which people decided, uh, and obviously legislation um, probably helped, um, that uh, <laughs> that this is this is what we're going to do, and and consensus is is the context for things like the Coppergate helmet, isn't it? Consensus is the context for these little intricate object biographies that we can get where we know where the gold came from and we know potentially that this person also made that thing that was found up in Scotland, but, you know, there's only two or three of them in, in existence. It's the, yeah, it's it's the uh, it's the resonance in which some of these individual little songs are heard, I suppose. Yeah. Mm. yeah. We, we live in the everyday and, and uh, so that, that's the picture that we, we need to assemble. And arguably, it's the picture that archaeology can best assemble. Problem with history, it tends to, history tends to talk about change. Mm. Archaeology tends to talk about, about continuity if we let it. And so it's um, uh, trying to get a bit of bigger picture, a better picture of you know what everybody's life was actually like. Um, and uh, the focus on... on you know, Stonehenge or those things that 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 focus on um, that ritual day. It it is interesting. It is important. It is part of what people believe. But frankly, the other three hundred and sixty three days that you spend rearing the pig or whatever, um, are, are the other is the truth of your life. Mm. Um, and uh, I'm interested in those uh, three hundred sixty three de days re rearing the pig, um, and that village blacksmith, um, you know, beating out of hour after hour after hour as he as he he, he forges metal. Um, that's that's what our ancestors were doing, and that uh, and we want to glimpse that world. And it is a fascinating world, and we can do that through those those little objects. But you know, they. Uh, they're challenging to interpret uh, and other people don't always value them as much as they should, I feel. And um, perhaps that's why I'm drawn to the arm helmet. I see it as a um, you know, part, part of that, that, that emerging world um, as, as we go into the, the kind of the, 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 the kind of the, 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 the greater production, the greater numbers of things. Um, individual warriors are, are fine, but it, it's perhaps not people who play in the Premier League, but it's it's those people on Sunday mornings who play in the five sides. Um, that's where I think um, the truth about the 20th or 21st century actually uh, lies. Um, and certainly that's uh, uh, the fascination for me. Okay, grand. Um, well, we'll leave it there for today. Thank you for your time today, Chris. Um, thank you guys for watching. If you have any particular questions or follow-ups, do comment below. Uh, and if there 
Uh, if they're of particular oh. interest, I'll pass them on to Chris. Who knows? He may even check in and, and have a look himself. <laughs> um, but um, as ever, guys, until next time, do take care. Bye-bye.